Gothic Tales of Terror This collection of short stories contains several gothic tales to bear macabre and chilling witness. These tales are designed to unsettle you, just a little, as you sit back and take in their words as they lead you on a walk to places you'd perhaps rather not visit on your own. These stories are read for you by many readers, including Gisela Rowe and Richard Midgley. The Wedding Knell by Nathaniel Hawthorne There is a certain church in the city of New York which I have always regarded with peculiar interest. On account of a marriage there solemnized under very singular circumstances in my grandmother's girlhood, that venerable lady chanced to be a spectator of the scene and ever after made it her favorite narrative. Whether the edifice now standing on the same site be the identical one of which she referred, I am not antiquarian enough to know, nor would it be worth while to correct myself, perhaps of an agreeable error, by reading the date of its erection on the tablet over the door. It is a stately church, surrounded by an enclosure of the loveliest green, within which appears urns, pillars, obelisks, and other forms of monumental marble, the tributes of private affection, or more splendid memorials of historic dust. With such a place, though the tumult of the city rolls beneath its tower, one would be willing to connect some legendary interest the marriage might be considered as the result of an earlier engagement, though there had been two intermediate weddings on the lady's part, and forty years of celibacy on that of the gentleman. At sixty-five, Mr. Ellenwood was a shy but not quite secluded man, selfish, like all men who brood over their own hearts, yet manifesting on rare occasions a vein of generous sentiment. A scholar throughout life, though always an indolent one, because his studies had no definite object, either of public advantage or personal ambition. A gentleman, high-bred and fastidiously delicate, yet sometimes requiring a considerable relaxation in his behalf of the common rules of society. In truth, there were so many anomalies in his character, and though shrinking with diseased sensibility from public notice, it had been his fatality so often to become the topic of the day, by some wild eccentricity of conduct, that people searched his lineage for an hereditary taint of insanity. But there was no need of this. His caprices had their origin in the mind that lacked the support of an engrossing purpose, and in feelings that preyed upon themselves for want of other food. If he were mad, it was the consequence and not the cause of an aimless, abortive life. The widow was as complete a contrast to her third bridegroom in everything but age, as can be well conceived. Compelled to relinquish her first engagement, she had been united to a man of twice her own years, to whom she became an exemplary wife, and by whose death she was left in possession of a splendid fortune. A southern gentleman, considerably younger than herself, succeeded to her hand, and carried her to Charleston, where, after many uncomfortable years, she found herself again a widow. It would have been singular, if any uncommon delicacy of feeling had survived through such a life as Mrs. Dabney's. It could not but be crushed and killed by her early disappointment. The cold duty of her first marriage, the dislocation of the heart's principles, consequent on a second union, 
and the unkindness of her southern husband, which had inevitably driven her to connect the idea of his death with that of her comfort. To be brief, she was that wisest but unloveliest variety of woman.